am your host, Edie French, and today we're here for a double celebration. It's the publication party for a fabulous new book and the premiere episode of an exciting new series of interviews with our wonderful Minnesota authors. We're honored to have Pulitzer Prize nominee Maria Hornbacher with us today. Uh, Maria is celebrating the publication of her new book, Madness, A Bipolar Life. Welcome, Maria. Welcome. Thank you for Thank having you me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you've just gotten back from tour. I can't believe you're sitting up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, you know, it's even better. I'm midway through tour. I, uh, I have done the East Coast. I'm in the Midwest. I'm on my way to the West Coast at about 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. And, and, and it's a glamorous life, oh, right? Oh, come on. <laughs> How's yeah, it going? It's, it's hilarious. It's tiny hotel rooms. It's big hotel rooms. It's trains. It's planes. It's automobiles. It's a whole lot of, you know, dirty faces and uh, mine. Uh, and it's uh, it's not glamorous, but it is exhilarating and it's fun. And and I just finished reading the book, and you're going to be kind enough to read. We're going to start off reading it just I in am. case any of our viewers haven't had the chance to to hear it yet. So we'll start there, and then we'll All have right. some more questions. All right, here's the hell of it. Madness doesn't announce itself. There isn't time to prepare for its coming. It shows up without calling and sits in your kitchen ashing in your plant. You ask how long it plans to stay. It shrugs its shoulders, gets up, and starts digging through the fridge. But even that implies some sort of lag time between the arrival of madness and the actual experience of it. In the early years, it's like a switch flips on, and although only a moment before you were totally sane, suddenly you've gone mad. But as you learn to manage madness, you begin to notice sooner that it's on its way. I lick my finger and hold it up to test the direction of the wind. Madness is in the air. I can smell it like I can smell snow. It's in the vicinity, though I don't know where or how long it will be until it comes. The trick is to shut the gate, throw sheets over the roses, go inside, lock all the windows and doors, and go down to the basement to sit on a chair and wait. Sometimes these preparations are enough. The locks on the windows and doors are tight. You've taken the medication faithfully. You've exercised to induce a sense of dopamine calm. You've put every lamp in the house in your office and flipped on the light box, and the room is lit up as if with floodlights and you're so hot you're working in your bra. You've stayed off the coffee, you've taken the supplements, you've worked starting at the same time and for the same length every day. You've interacted with human beings at least a few times this week, you've gotten yourself to the point where you sleep in the normal time frame from night until morning, and your mornings are not a horrible struggle to stay out of bed, and you make the bed so you aren't tempted to get back in it, you check off the entries on the list that runs your life. But sometimes the system fails. Maybe it's a chemical shift in the brain that the medications don't block. Maybe it's a stressor in your life that you didn't expect. Maybe there is no reason, and you're just going mad for the hell of it. But you try not to think about that, because that would imply that no matter what you do, no matter how tightly you batten the hatches, madness can still get in. You wake up one morning, and there it is, sitting in an old plaid bathrobe in your kitchen, unpleasant and unshaved. You look at it, heart sinking. Madness is a rotten guest. You can tell it to leave till you're blue in the face, you follow it around the house, explaining that it's come at a bad time, and could it come another day? Eventually, you give up and go back to bed, shutting the door. But, of course, it barges in and demands to be entertained. Before you know it, it has strewn its stuff all over the house, and there are sticky plates in its bed, and it refuses to change its sheets. Madness lounges all day in front of the TV, watching Oprah and munching on a bag of chips, drinking milk from the carton, getting crumbs between the cushions of the couch. Soon, your life revolves around it. You do everything you can to keep it comfortable because you don't want to upset it. You tiptoe around the house and wait for it to leave. In most cases, you wake up one morning and it's gone. There's minimal damage. You pick up its mess and get on with your day. But soon, madness has worn you down. It's easier to do what it says than to argue. In this way, it takes over your mind. You no longer know where it ends and you begin. You believe anything it says, you do what it tells you, no matter how extreme or absurd. If it says you're worthless, you agree. You plead for it to stop. You promise to behave. You are on your knees before it, and it laughs. Mm. Thank you, Maria. Um, for me, this book <laughs> was gripping. And to say that, I mean, literally. I read it, and I had an advanced publication copy. 
and from the very, I usually don't read prologues. I started with the prologue because I thought I'll do dil diligence on this. <laughs> <So I> might <laughs> miss something important. I literally, once I started, I held it like this. It, it wasn't dropped in the bathtub. I didn't <laughs> bathe. I, I mean, I, I read it every single page. Most of the book is, it, it's a, like a daily journal. It's not mm -hmm. every day, but it is written very much in the present tense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is, we are with you. Mm -hmm. We are with you on that roller coaster. Mm -hmm. It is right now, right here. Can you talk about your writing, your, the, the process of time, how you wrote? Were, were you really writing every day? Was that a journal? Or do you just have incredible recall and ability to bring back those experiences because it takes place over such a long period of time. It does take place over a long period of time, so I wasn't detailing the journal as I went. Many of the parts in the fourth section where it is the present day were written as they were happening. You know, I would have an event, I would sit down and write out the event, and so those are very much time stopped. They're right there. Um, I do have a kind of memory for detail, except that my memory, of course, is compromised, fractured by electroconvulsive therapy, by the fact that I have a mental illness. And so the process of writing this book entailed also a great deal of my journalistic background and research and interviews and hospital records. And so piecing together something that could be written in the first person was a little bit of a project. <laughs> it, it was a huge project. It was a huge project. <laughs> um, it not only was a project, but um... I, when I got done with it, and I would not say it was an, it, it was, I couldn't put it down, but it wasn't an easy read mm -hmm. because we were there with you. Um, and when I got to the end of it, I thought, what a gift. What a gift to anyone who has a sibling, anyone who has a spouse, anyone who has a relative, a coworker with mental illness. I mean, I, I don't know of anything else that brings you into the mind and this is a little bit of a question about language because sometimes we we tiptoe around mm -hmm. <laughs> you know we don't want to offend somebody right. we don't shit 